always has to talk about small and elegant versus complicated and realistic. Two very different sort of modeling approaches that any modeler uh, sort of tends to fall into one camp or the other. So one side of this is the highly abstract model, these simple elegance model where you have some highly abstracted observation about cultural process. Um, ideally, this ends up with creating some sort of thought-provoking emergent mechanism, some sort of deep underlying individual level um, uh, behavior that aggregates up to one of these really interesting large-scale archaeological questions that we're particularly interested in. <clears throat> the, the classic critique of these is that when you have this kind of simple and elegant model, often they are completely incomparable to the archaeological record. They don't produce a, a map of archaeological hearths that you can walk out into the archaeological record, pick up a site report, and be like, yes, I got it. That just doesn't really happen. Um, so the other side of this is often what non-modelers really wish that we were doing, which is these highly realistic models where you have sort of actual individuals walking around in society, walking to and from camp, picking up resources and creating some sort of trade system where they interact with each other, essentially doing exactly what it is that we think is happening in the archaeological record writ large. Um, on the other hand, if there are as many variables, as many different types of interactions as the sort of non-modeler thinks they are, um, then it's unanalyzable. You create a simulation and a simulation output, which is so complicated, you do not know what's happening inside it. It becomes kind of a black box that you just cannot understand those dynamics. So these are the kind of different um, contrasting sides of this, ideally if we did understand what this thing was, it would be producing an actual archaeological record. We could directly walk up to a site report, compare the two, and they would match. Probably not, but even if it did, are you right? Is it matching because you have added so many elements of the model and you kept adding the elements of the model until it did? Or does it match because you actually recreated the social process of this intensely complicated society. So both of these are kind of stereotyped versions of modeling. Neither one, both have their pros, both have their cons. Um, and I'm going to try to persuade you that we need to stop talking about these highly stereotype, um, stereotypical type of models. This does kind of come back to um, perhaps influential is the wrong word, influential among modelers anyway, uh, a 2010 paper by Luke Primo where he went into the fundamental theory of modeling and why we do it. And he has this lovely little um, uh, diagram here, this emulation version in the, the dark path. Um, I don't think he meant that. But the, <laughs> the dark, realistic, these sort of big society models that he's talking about, and the, the path of the light uh, traveling off to the right hand, these highly exploratory, very sort of abstracted models on the other side. So these were contrasted as two very different approaches to modeling, just like the ones that I just described there. But the thing is, is that these two approaches are not research questions. So what is the research question? Well, research question number one, do I really know what I think I know? Does this archaeological hypothesis that I've posed of the archaeological record, that classic interpretation section at the end of your archaeological paper that says this is what is happening in the society, yes, we can create a model of that, right? So this is the kind of hypothesis testing side of this. The other question that is, of course, interesting to, to all modelers is what else am I going to discover? If I put all of these things in, what I think was going on, what are the emergent properties? What is the sort of cool new thing that pops out of my model when I simulate it? So these are the two questions that we are sort of interested in when we start modeling things. My point today is that both of these questions apply to both of these lines of research. They're not mutually exclusive, although they have been posed that way. Okay, so 
This classic, to sort of combine two classic um, modeling phrases, all models are wrong. Yes, they are. Just like all archaeological interpretations are wrong, right? We never capture the entirety of the thing. We are always describing some aspect of social process. So all models are wrong, and to sort of add in uh, Isa's phrase from yesterday, is it useful? Does it contribute something interesting? So both of these um, modeling approaches that I mentioned, we can always come up with examples of sort of bad models. Let's leave those aside, the ones that are not um, well modeled or not well analyzed, that sort of thing. So let's sort of throw out the straw men of those stereotyped uh, modeling types. And really what we're talking about, which is what Juan Barcello was mentioned, uh, talking about earlier, is that what we're really interested in is the underlying mechanism. To a non-modeler, this is the social process, big umbrella. To a modeler dealing with a complex system, we are focused down into the sort of underlying individualized behavior that ends up creating this big interesting pattern. Both of those things can appear within a highly complex realistic model and within the sort of highly abstract uh, modeling type. And I would argue that in both cases, what we should be doing is trying to focus down onto those underlying mechanisms. I also want to say that any model that you do, whether it is a highly abstract one, it can be elaborated up. You can dial it up by adding complexity to it, by adding new types of agents, by adding new types of societies. You can simulate a little foraging group, then you can simulate another little foraging group interacting with that. So any highly abstract model can be dialed up, and likewise any highly realistic model can be distilled down into simpler components. <laughs> These things are not mutually exclusive. They're uh, just sort of ends of a spectrum. And again, at the end of the day, does it tell an interesting story? Are, is this a useful model? Is it contributing something new in terms of knowledge about the past? Again, both types and all the range in between, um, hopefully, will tell an interesting story. And if it does, then it's a useful model. If it does not, then we need to go back to the drawing board and keep working. OK, so a blended approach. We can dial up or dial down any model. Time? Am I done? Hurry up. Uh, I'm just going to say we can explore the sort of exploratory approach to a highly realistic model. And we can sort of emulate and apply these highly abstract models to uh, concrete archaeological records. We can take components of each and blend the two together and to uh, continue. Great. Any questions? Any comments on that? Yeah. Um, so I think it's a really interesting point. Like, um, as you said, if you're just increasing the number of parameters in your model, you're, you can kind of get any result you want from it. And I think in archaeology, we all know it's really difficult to find exact parameter values as well for things. So, you know, changing these values very slightly can have massive impacts on the outcome. So I'm really on the side of small and elegant. However, as a modeler, I know that my model still has 11 parameters. So you know, I, it's a very difficult thing to balance, I think. And I don't know if there is a solution. Of I guess what I'm, what I'm talking about, yes, I mean, even a simple model is highly complex, right? Even the birds create highly complex patterns. Um, so that is going to be always true. But again, we shouldn't be focusing on parameters and parameter values. Yes, they are necessary. But what is the mechanism underlying it? Even in a highly complicated model, a whole society model, um, there should be some underlying mechanism that we are actually seeking to explain. If we spend all our time focusing on you know, coming up with the parameter value, then we're kind of missing the point a little bit. We need to be thinking about that underlying mechanism and what is actually, what is it doing? And does that reflect something that we think is actually happening in the archaeological record rather than is the catchment size 10? Does that make sense? Yeah, but isn't it every mechanism you add to it is going to be increasing the parameters as well? <laughs> yes, Fine. ish, maybe. I don't know, what do you think? I feel like I this feel is an evolutionary science. process. Like this is kind of evolutionary process in the in the whole grand scheme of science. You know, 
I feel like the number of parameters we put in is a direct result of how little we know. So that's why no modeler would ever say, oh, stop going in the field and getting us data. No, the more we know, the more the more bits of the model we can just put in without you know, making it a variable, without you know, finding parameter values. So it kind of feels like, yeah, at the moment in archaeology is a little bit wobbly because we know, we know so little in the sense that so little is formalized, so little is tested, that you actually test so many different things in your model. But I, I feel like it's going to get better and better as we go, if you all model. <laughs> Phil? Well, what, are the, what are the implications of that, of the comparability of models? If, say, the sweet spot for Colin's model is eight parameters and the sweet spot for, for your model is, is 11, mm -hmm. how do we start comparing between different scenarios so that it may nonetheless be related if everybody's intuition about what is an appropriate number of parameters or mechanisms investigated? There's no yes. answer to that except for you. No one model would, will give you the full and final answer. And the more models you run, the better understanding you can get. So if you have a model of, with eight parameters and then another one with 11, the interesting thing is to compare which of the par those parameters in those models uh, actually impact on the results, because probably not all of them will. But, if but there are those comparing same, models, are we? We're, we're comparing human societies. Yeah, people. sure, sure. But that, that's the, it's like, you know, it's like making a map. You can make a map with, that shows X number of things or another map that shows less number of things and then which one captures the past reality better. When, well, that's why we test each parameter and if two models that are built completely differently come up to similar results with the same mechanism, that is indicative. If they don't, then that is an indication that there's something missing in our conceptual models. That there is, you know, that there are two possibilities, two trajectories that could lead to similar similar results. So that is a result in itself. But the, I wouldn't say, oh, if you have more parameters, then you're definitely worse than somebody with less parameters. That's just that's just crazy. Well, I think you can get to a stable understanding of your system by building your model up. So you start with your parameters, or you start with your landscape, and you have a realistic GIS landscape, and you have some kind of retrodicted climate model. You know this was happening. And so you can have that, and you, when you run your model, you can have some kind of output that usually stays within these values. So you know these are predicted, and once you get a stable understanding of that model, then you can build on top of it. But I think it's the throwing everything in at the beginning that's the problem. And I don't think you should you know, keep trying to overfit your model, but you might have you might start with the model. Like isa has been working on the spread of hominids out of Africa. So she might come up with a very stable early model, but then she can build on top of it. And it's not that, oh no, she went from seven parameters to 11 parameters. She went from seven parameters to having a stable system that she understands quite well. And then she has more parameters that she looks at. And so I think that that's, <laughs> yeah. I think it's not a question of how many parameters are okay. I think the question is, at what point are you convinced? Do you know what's going on? And at what point can you convince other people that you know what's going on? And can it be reproduced by other people? And then go to town. Have 100 parameters, I don't care. <laughs> but as long as you understand what's going on in, in, yeah. in an iterative fashion, I think that's great. Because yeah, I'm, I'm in the same camp as Elizabeth with the simple is better, but we know reality isn't simple. I mean, you know, we're not fooling ourselves. We know societies are not simple. We know things, there are a lot of factors. So, yeah. yeah. Well, um, and then use supercomputers. <laughs> uh, one thing is that the model that we need to answer different research questions, but if, it's, if you think it's model as a hypothesis and you want to do it against the same data, so a hypothesis or explanation, uh, of uh, some kind of observation, then there are methods to uh, combine the number of, or the complexity of the model plus the theory of the evidence in uh, model selection. So, uh, and it's actually an ongoing debate right now in concrete research. It's not only archaeology, it's everybody that's using this information. Yeah. And I would say that one of the solutions to having plus parameters is to use different types of, of modeling techniques that are not agent-based modeling. 